Hello all, the topic to be discussed today is physiological factors that influence blood pressure and mechanisms that can control it. My name is Abdul Baraka and the name of the business for this presentation is Baraka Rehabilitation and Human Movement. Presentation structure. This topic has been broken down into three smaller questions being the classification of blood pressure, the physiological factors influencing changes in blood pressure and finally the mechanisms of which can control blood pressure. The questions have been broken down into further subcategories where in classification of blood pressure the different age groups and how they differ are addressed. The physiological factors are described separately including their mechanisms of control. All figures and tables have been put in to assist with understanding the information. The objective of this presentation is to help you understand what hypertension is, what can change blood pressure levels to lead to hypertension and how to control it if it gets to that stage. Classification of blood pressure. The US Department of Health and Human Services classified blood, pre blood pressure into four stages being normal, prehypertension, stage one and stage two hypertension. Cobanian and colleagues from the Joint National Committee on Prevention, Detection, Evaluation and Treatment of High Blood Pressure also classify their blood pressure categories in the same way. Mancia and colleagues on the other hand, although they have an article written 10 years ahead of these other two, they still have the categories in five, being an addition of stage 3 hypertension, which is a reading of something equal to or above 180 over 110. It appears to be unnecessary to have this extra group based on the literature. It appears that stage 2 and stage 3 hypertension is similar in terms of management. Lerb and colleagues from the <coughs> European Society of Hypertension state that the above classifications apply to young adults, middle age and elderly population. It is stated that criteria used to class hypertension in children and adolescent teens between the ages of 1 to 18 is based on percentiles of the above classifications. Normal blood pressure is defined as less than 90th percentile, whereas hypertension is defined as being above the 95th percentile. These percentile measures are based on the variables of age, sex and height. It is stated that the diagnosis of hypertension in children and adolescent teens should be based on multiple office blood pressure measurements. Due to the consideration of the difficulty level to define hypertension in ages of 1 to 18 as done in adults because of the concept that blood pressure in children increases with age and body size. Observing blood pressure control in children and adolescent and adolescence is crucial to avoid hypertension in adulthood. Repeated measurements of blood pressure to reduce measurement error in children are identified with elevated blood pressure along with assessment of comorbidities if any. Comorbidities to take into consideration include body size, family history of cardiovascular disease and critical levels of blood pressure. Mahoney and colleagues state that children are particularly likely to become adults with high blood pressure if either they are obese as children or become obese as young adults, or if they have a family history of hypertension. Physiological factors influencing blood pressure. In order to understand the physiological factors influencing blood pressure, it is crucial to break down the term physiological and look into the aspects of which it refers to. Physiology refers to the physical and chemical functions and activities of living organisms and their parts. In saying that, the question arises that of which bodily functions influence blood pressure, but in order to understand that, the physiology of the cardiovascular system needs to be addressed. Basically, fresh oxygenated blood is forced out of the left ventricle into the aorta, which is then branched into arteries and arterioles. Once oxygen is used up, the blood returns to the heart by the veins. In order for the blood to keep moving through the system, a certain amount of force is required. Blood pressure is a term used to refer to that force. That has been defined that way by Moser. The American Heart Association defines blood pressure as a force that blood exerts against inner blood vessel walls. By having a greater understanding of the pathogenesis of high blood pressure, it will lead to greater implication of blood pressure control through highly targeted therapies and empirical treatment that will then reduce morbidity. Factors. The following are the factors influencing blood pressure. More than 90% of cases of hypertension do not have a clear cause as stated by Aparo and colleagues and Vikran and Tiwa. Hypertension has a tendency to cluster in families, usually representing a collection of inherited genetic-based diseases as stated by Lifton and colleagues. This is represented 
under figure number one um, of several of several physiological factors influencing blood pressure. This figure displays the factors that play a role or have an influence on blood pressure, including the nervous system, cardiac, renal, gastrointestinal, and endocrine systems, along with sex and age, as discussed earlier. High blood pressure is associated with coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, and neural disease, where the extent of organ involvement determines outcomes such as stroke and myocardial infarctions, as stated by Diffiel and C. The main physiological aspects to be discussed and appear to be the most recurring reasons of high blood pressure, as shown in Beaver's article, are the central nervous system, cardiac output, and renal mechanisms. Joyner and colleagues completed a study where they set out to see whether the sympathetic nervous system plays a role in long-term blood pressure regulation in humans. The way they did this was by collecting direct measurements of muscle sympathetic nerve activity, which will be referred to as MSNA. MSNA is a direct measure of neural activity to skeletal muscle, where vasoconstrictors are used as a control to hemodynamic control, both at rest and during daily activities, as stated by Fagius and Wallen. MSNA, along with hemodynamic measurements, allow us to see the relationship between sympathetic neural activity and blood pressure regulation. Joyner and colleagues conducted the experiment by comparing MSNA to cardiac output, where they hypothesized that low cardiac output would influence higher sympathetic nerve activity and vascular resistance. Their results displayed in figure number 3 show an inverse relationship between MSNA and cardiac output. Scarf, Fidensian and colleagues hypothesized that nitric oxide release from vascular endothelium is proportional to sympathetic activity. This counteracts vasoconstriction caused by MSNA. Joyner and colleagues tested this by administering nitric oxide in the form of in the form of N monomethyl or arginine, where it was found that blood pressure increased in subjects with high levels of MSNA. This led to the conclusion that humans with high levels of baseline MSNA are at a higher risk of hypertension. Conditions associated with blood pressure elevation due to sympathetic nerve activation. This table, collected from Mancia and Grassi, displays the conditions characterized by blood pressure elevation due to sympathetic activation as shown by the up arrows. The up arrows under the MSNA. Um, the results in this table display that sympathetic hyperactivity is a generalized phenomenon as seen by blood pressure increase shown by an increase in plasma norepinephrine. Um, and its correlation with increased MSNA resulting in hypertension in males and females. Cardiac output and blood pressure. Cardiac output is another physiological factor influencing blood pressure. Clark explains that the linkage of cardiac output to blood pressure is through the blood vessels and circulation. Blood vessels carry blood to the body's tissues and organs, decreasing in size the further the distance they move from the heart. The blood vessels in the cardiovascular system include arteries, which, break, which branch off into arterioles, capillaries, venules and veins, which return back to the heart. Vasomotor fibers either receive impulses to contract and reduce the diameter of the blood vessel, which is known as vasoconstriction, or do the opposite, where the fibers relax, increasing vessel diameter known as vasodilation. Vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the arteries and arterioles affect blood flow and pressure. Khatib and El Gwendi state that the causes for systolic hypertension are due to increased cardiac output, which is due to aortic valvular insufficiency. Aortic valve insufficiency, also known as aortic valve prolapse or aortic valve regulation, is a heart valve disease where the aortic valve does not close tightly, which allows, flood, which allows blood to flow back from the aorta into the left ventricle each time the heart beats. This leads to the left ventricle to widen and stronger heartbeats, which over time will lead to the heart becoming less able to supply enough blood to the body as stated by the U.S. National Library of Medicine. This is also supported by Becker Diven and Graysburn, where it is stated that acute aortic regurgitation causes hypotension, whereas chronic severe aortic regurgitation is typically accompanied by systolic hypertension due to increased left ventricle volume and hence pressure overload. On the other hand, Mayet and Hughes states that circulation involves mean arterial pressure, cardiac output, 
and peripheral resistance. This places an emphasis on that of blood pressure was that on that if blood pressure was to increase, it would be due as a result of increased cardiac output and increase in total peripheral resistance or a combination of both. People that have hypertension is usually due to increased peripheral vascular resistance, which is present in but not limited to limited to renal, skeletal and pulmonary territories. Along with increased pulmonary vascular resistance, heart rate may be higher than that it is in normal people, but stroke volume is usually reduced. This decrease in stroke volume typically reduces cardiac output, which provides significant contribution to elevated blood pressure. This usually occurs during exercise, where stroke volume fails to increase in response to exercise due to concentric hypertrophy of the heart. Renal mechanisms. Moser stated that approximately 4% of high blood pressure cases can be traced back to a form of renal disorder. The role of the kidneys is to regulate the volume of body fluid and its sodium and water balance. The linkage of sodium to the blood is through the retention of sodium in the body. If too much sodium is consumed in the kidneys, volume of body fluid increases which in turn places a burden on the heart to maintain an adequate flow of blood to tissues, which in turn um, leads to a rise in blood pressure. According to Margaro and Neves, the relationship between hypertension and the renal system is due to chronic kidney disease. This is also supported by Kaplan, where it is said that insufficiency of the kidney causes high blood pressure contributing to an approximate 5% of cases of hypertension. Hypertension tends to occur in the late stages of chronic kidney disease. The factors usually involve increased intermuscular volume, and excessive activity of the renin angiotensin system, which is a system that has effects on the homeostasis control blood pressure and, stodi and sodium, as stated by Sparks and colleagues. The way the renin angiotensin system affects blood pressure is due to the secretion of renin by juxtaglomerular cells which divide angiotensinogen, um, leading to an increase in angiotensin levels, which is a vasoconstrictor which stimulates the production of aldosterone. This then increases the renal sodium absorption and helps blood pressure return to normal levels. Now this is all, all okay um, if blood pressure was low. If blood volume is normal, the increase in renin angiotensin system activity results in abnormal rise in blood pressure. So this figure, figure number six, shows a linkage between um, the factors to be discussed, the cardiac output, the kidney, and the central, um, the nervous system, sympathetic nervous system. As you can see, the sympathetic nervous system deals with stroke volume, which then goes to cardiac output and influence of blood pressure, and the kidney also deals with the blood volume and stroke volume, which then goes to cardiac output and blood pressure also. Mechanisms of blood pressure control. Stoltz discusses that of which has been discussed by myself as it links to blood pressure. It is specifically mentioned that a variety of cardiovascular control systems, including the baroreceptor reflex, um, previously discussed through vasomotor fibers, the renin angiotensin system, and through the release of nitric oxide previously discussed with the central nervous system. Stoll states that these systems discussed as physiological factors influencing blood pressure are not only the factors, but also the mechanisms, as he says that once arterial blood pressure deviates from its set point, these mechanisms activate in order to restore it. It is stated that although these systems contribute to blood pressure control, they do occur at deferring response times by a considerable margin, where the baroreceptor reflex occurs much sooner than the renin angiotensin system. Baroreceptors participate in fluid regulation by the kidney and hence has a potential to adjust blood pressure, as stated by Kugius. Baroreceptors are stretch sensitive fibers located in the aortic arch and each of the carotid sinuses. Baroreceptors provide afferent signals to the medulla, which in turn maintains mean arterial pressure. An increase in mean arterial pressure leads to the stimulation of baroreceptors, which leads to a decrease in sympathetic outflow signal to the heart and peripheral vessels, which then restores mean arterial pressure to normal levels. If mean arterial pressure decreased, the opposite will occur where sympathetic outflow signals increase. Baroreceptors are engaged at normal resting blood pressure in a state 
in a stable hemodynamic state, which projects that there is an ongoing level of baroreceptor reflex activity. This is a cardiac output process, but occurs via the central nervous system, as if it is a, as if it is a feedback system involving the brainstem, hypothalamus, and medulla. CNS and blood pressure control. Afferent and efferent neurons link the CNS to visceral effectors. Sympathetic and parasympathetic pathways consisting of preganglionic neurons located within the CNS innervate ganglia um, and glands such as the adrenal gland outside the CNS. These networks contain motor neurons that control muscles. The neural control for blood circulation operates through parasympathetic neurons that innervate the heart and sympathetic neurons that innervate blood vessels, medulla and kidneys along with the heart also. This is a control that regulates blood pressure control through the baroreceptor as mentioned earlier by Guy Nett. Concluding. In conclusion, it is seen that blood pressure can be labelled as either normal, prehypertension, or finally either stage 1 or stage 2 hypertension. The physiological factors described including that of the CNS, cardiac output and the central and the renal system. It is seen that although each has its own mechanism, they are all connected in maintaining blood pressure regulation. This can be further seen when the mechanism of blood pressure control was described where it was established that the CNS was linked to the baroreceptors which was a cardiac output function and they were both linked to the renal system through the neuron pathways as seen in the figures. This information is critical in clinical practice firstly because if we do not have an understanding on the mechanisms we could not have the ability to effectively treat patients. Secondly, having this information allows us to summarize the issues occurring to the patients, allowing them to understand its complexity and the need to implement our guidelines and recommendations we give them. Thirdly, having this information allows us to understand the extent to which we can provide treatment through exercise, understanding the ranges of resting heart rate and to which we can take it safely and how other and how their body is likely to respond in this condition. Lastly, understanding details such as renal involvement allows us to make lifestyle modification recommendations such as reducing dietary sodium intake. References Thank you for listening.